In this video, I'm going to show you 15 different career options for an electrical engineering degree. So if you're someone who's studying electrical or electronics, or you're thinking about it, um, this video is definitely going to help you figure out 15 different ways that you can do something with this degree once you finish it. If you're for the first time, my name is Ali. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Job Projan Laboratory. And I basically make these videos because electrical engineering is fun and I'm having too much fun at work. I want you guys to have just as much fun. So let's jump in. So I'm going to be basing these career options uh, based on this book that I wrote a long time ago. Uh, it's called What Every Electrical Engineering Student Must Know. We're here, I basically provide a roadmap for what you should do uh, in electrical engineering. There is a digital copy, a PDF, which if you can join our Discord, you can get it uh, if you want, or you can get it on Amazon as well. I'll put a link for it. But basically, I'm just going to go to chapter three, which talks about the 15 different options, and I'll go through them one by one, and I'll show you guys some examples as well. So in this case, the very first career option or branch of electrical engineering I, I start with uh, is electronics. And uh, it's worth saying that before I go through any of that, um, there are different things you can do with electrical engineering. Like you can be a design engineer, you can be a testing engineer, you can be a field engineer. You can be doing like hands-on things or you can do like things that are entirely computer simulations. Um, there are, or you could be like in some type of interdisciplinary role where you can work with other types of engineers. Like there are just so many opportunities, but the way I break them is branch by branch. So let's just go ahead and do them. So the first one in this case I have is electronics. And electronics, electronics are very simple. Electronics just deal with electronic circuits. So if you have never seen what a circuit looks like, it's basically something like this. There's usually a battery or some power source involved, and there is some type of devices that um, cause electrical current to go through. These are called uh, uh, resistors. Basically, if you have a circuit and there's a resistor, uh, the resistor basically prevents the, the, the uh, or, or slows down the current uh, going through based on how much resistance there is. Um, basically, a, 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 some type of power source, like a battery, uh, a, re a resistor or a load or some type of device connected to it with some source causes current to go through from the power source to the load. And that's basically your circuit. You basically have the voltage, you have the resistance, and then you have the current. And that really is the foundation of all of it. A very basic circuit uh, or electronics uh, looks, <laughs> can, can look something like this or even more advanced circuits like, I don't know, like an amplifier circuit. Uh, is a bit more more intense usually involving transistors, uh, involving capacitors, involving more devices. So one, one branch of electrical engineering that's very popular is electronics, is people that design these circuits and design electronic circuits. And one thing that's really nice is once you design the electronic circuits, uh, you can go ahead and build them yourself. You can integrate them yourself. Uh, there's something called a breadboard uh, in which you can just like start plugging things inside. Uh, such as the wires, the components that I was talking about, and these have like metal connections, uh, so they, they, they close the circuit. Or if you want to be even fancier, you can build a PCB, a printed circuit board. Uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a very intense one, uh, which is basically like this, where as you, what you can see here, these are like traces. These are made of a like uh, some type of conducting material, uh, and this is basically like a wire. Uh, and you can design these. And actually, my, my very first internship at the NASA uh, Kennedy Space Center, uh, I designed a bunch of these boards. So um, NASA Kennedy, um, yeah, right here. So this is all the way back in 2017. And one, as part of my project, I was I was building circuits. I, I built these breadboards, for example. These are breakout boards uh, for these. These are basically connect, a bunch of connectors. Uh, but then we would also like try to uh, emulate some of these resistors. Uh, and voltages uh, that I was mentioning, and then we would try to build them. And the way I would build them is I would actually build uh, PCBs, and I would use a software called Altium Designer. Uh, and it's just it's just like super super fun because you basically place um, the the components on the circuit board, and then you can go ahead and uh, start tracing things. And it's just so much fun. So electronics is really fun because there's just so many within it. There's so many different areas. You can obviously do the design on the computer. You can just get like uh, electronic kits and then like build things yourself with just a bunch of devices like LEDs uh, or like uh, things like that. You can make a little audio speaker. You can make an alarm. Uh, the sky really is the limit uh, with what you can do. Now that's one, that's, that's just one area within 15 uh, different areas. The next branch I basically talk about is computer engineering. And computer engineering is actually its own major but it is a branch of electrical engineering, technically, because electrical engineering uh, is basically any type of engineering that deals with electricity, right? Hence, it's electrical. And computers are made of very advanced electronic circuits. Uh, hence, computer engineering is really a branch of electrical engineering. A very good understanding of electrical engineering 
should help you get a better understanding of computer engineering. Nonetheless, computers are obviously their own domain, and every computer um, uh, like involves a, a, a range of very complicated circuitry. Some of these circuits are analog, some of these are digital. There's a difference between circuits that are digital and circuits that are analog. So um, uh, analog versus digital circuits. Let's see if there's a very quick picture I can show you maybe. So um, this is basically a really good way to put it. So like a any type of analog signal uh, deals with like real world information. Like for example, this uh, me talking right now and my, 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 my voice being picked up by the microphone, that's an analog signal. The microphone picks it up uh, because there are fluctuations in the air. Now what the microphone is gonna do or the, or, or the, the, the software involved is probably gonna try to sample it and break it down into like bits, and then it's gonna make it into like a discrete uh, digital signal, for example. So digital circuits are really just about switching circuits, about having two values that you're constantly switching in between. Analog circuits are just about uh, having the actual real world value itself. So in a digital circuit, you may have five volts and like zero volts or 3.3 volts and zero volts. Uh, in an analog circuit, you'll have whatever voltage gets picked up. You could have three volts, seven volts, 10 volts, uh, that's the idea. Computer engineering, the whole field of computer engineering is generally built on the idea of digital circuits. So most computer, uh, um, m m most, most things that you learn about in computer engineering uh, are, are computer circuits. And some of these, the, some of the more popular ones, like you hear in a computer, there's like a processor uh, generally, and it would look, uh, it basically looks something like this. There's an integrated circuit inside of it. It's like, it's m more really like this. There's just so much going on inside that little tiny thing. Uh, there's the RAM, the random access memory. Uh, that's basically where like some of the information uh, gets stored, so you can call on it and use. Um, and where, where where the processor is most more like the thinking part of the brain, where that's actually uh, doing the execution and the computation at all times. Uh, then you have like the hard drive. That's where like long term uh, bits of information are stored. That's where like it looks like that. So a hard drive is literally just like like a digital hard drive. Is literally just like ones and zeros stored in like massive amounts and that's where you could have like photos that's where you could have things like like that um so that's you can learn all about within computer engineering that's the hardware aspect but computer engineering also involves a lot of software and uh especially software that interfaces with the metal so languages like c for example uh, or c uh, it's a very very common uh language uh, for electrical engineers and for computer engineers um to learn and that's because um, some, something like C or C++, uh, it's, it's the, it, it compiles and then it runs and then it's, it's basically a lot, a lot, uh, it, it does that a lot faster um, than other, some, some of the higher level uh, languages. So when you, when you have a very good understanding of C, for example, you need to understand pointers and you need to understand where things are being stored in, in, in memory. Uh, and, and higher la level languages, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, so someone studying a computer science degree will probably still learn C, C++, will probably still get an understanding of these things. But with computer engineering as, as, as a major or as a branch, uh, you get to get a really good understanding of how the actual uh, bits get compiled and then how they actually get stored on, on the computer uh, level. So it's really, really a cool branch if you want to dive deep into computers. If you love computers, you obsess over computers, uh, obviously computer engineering is a good branch. Now, the third one I have mentioned in this, in this case is software engineering. In this case, I mentioned computer science. Now, computer science technically is its own field. Like computer science is really based mostly on math and based on algorithms and computing. Uh, it's, the application of it happens to be within uh, like uh, electricity and hardware and computers. So software engineer, engineering is really the more accurate uh, term that I would use in this case. However, the idea is the same, is that you're, you're programming things at a high level uh, and this is something a lot of students do not understand is that when you study electrical engineering, especially if you take some software classes, you can still be a very good uh, software developer. You can still be a very good software engineer and you can learn uh, many, many, uh, many things while in classes or, or on side projects or things of that nature. So I, when, I, when I went to undergrad, I studied electrical engineering. A lot of my friends who studied electrical engineering went and got jobs as software developers or as software engineers. Many of them. I, like. I, I think like 40% of them, maybe 50% of them. It's kind of crazy. A lot of them went into software. And that's something I, I, I advise a lot of people, at least in the United States. I don't know what it's like in other countries, uh, but if you don't really know what to do between like electrical or computer or software, uh, electrical is a lot more broad and then you can dive in deeper with computer um, and then uh, engineering and then you can learn software as well and you can get a job as software 
uh, engineer. So software is actually one of the career options you can have with an electrical engineering degree. Now, a bit more sophisticated type of software uh, is what I mentioned here, which is embedded systems. And an embedded system is basically just like a kind of a specialized computer. So like a laptop or a desktop computer, like a general purpose computer does all types of computations. An embedded system usually has like a specialized application that it's built for doing. Uh, embedded systems, uh, like for example, embedded system circuit would look something like this, or in this case, like you're getting some type of measurement with some type of sensors and you're doing something with them. Uh, embedded systems are super, super, super cool because basically all specialized applications uh, that use some type of microcontroller or microchip uh, that run 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 software uh, but have some type of hardware sensors uh, that is essentially an embedded system like your thermostat that adjusts your temperature or something in here like that's displaying like let's say in this case it seems like some heart rate uh, data uh, or pulse based on some sensor uh, you 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 basically do that by building an embedded system and embedded systems are basically based on these micro microprocessors mostly that's really the heart of the embedded system. And you program that uh, in different languages. The most popular are really C, C++. Uh, if you use uh, Arduino microcontrollers, which are very, very popular, uh, there's actually, like anytime someone asks me uh, about a project that they should get started on, I always point them to this Arduino microcontroller uh, because this you can do a lot of things with this. Uh, it's, you can program it in C++, I believe. It has its own libraries. And then you can connect it to things and build all sorts of things. You can build like LEDs, you can build alarm clocks, you can build counters, uh, you can connect it to a remote controller. Really, a sky is the limit with what you can do with something like this. Um, so embedded systems is really kind of a, a, the interface of electrical engineering, software engineering, and computer engineering, in which you are basically programming a mini computer to do a specialized function. Uh, and like, if you think of the internet of things, or if you think like any type of like wearables or any type of sensors that we anticipate to put on clothes or th things like that, that's what you would do with like a systems, uh, embedded systems job. Very cool, uh, very cool career. Next in here is we have antennas. Now I'm very biased towards antennas because uh, like I love, love, love antennas and I work on antennas. So like uh, I work at the NASA Joe Pulsion Lab and we, we operate some of the coolest and largest antennas. They look like this. And this in this case, this is a dish antenna. Uh, and, and the antenna itself is just the device that radiates or picks up electrical energy. In this case, like in theory, this large thing is just a reflector dish. It's just a, a mirror. Now you might say, okay, how is this a mirror? This is like made of metal. It's not made of like glass or mirror material. Well, electromagnetic waves, especially at radio and microwave frequencies, get reflected by metals. Hence, like a metal uh, is, is a mirror, technically, uh, for uh, like it, it, it reflects electromagnetic uh, signals. The antenna is really like somewhere over here. So like, the, let's say the signal comes from deep space, it hits like some place on this dish somewhere, it gets redirected over here. I believe like this is a secondary uh, reflector and then it gets like picked up over here. Um, or in some cases, this would be like where the feed or the receiver is, uh, depending on what kind of antenna you are. Now this is a dish antenna, it's a very spe specific type of antenna. You can have omnidirectional antennas. Um, so you have basically, you've probably seen these, like uh, it's literally, it literally looks like this. And it's literally just a piece of wire that radiates electrical, uh, electromagnetic waves in all directions. This is what the radiation pattern would look like. Um, and basically you've seen these on, on cars, on old cell phones, uh, they used to look like that as well. But the whole idea is that antennas in general, like antenna engineering, uh, is all about radiating electromagnetic waves. It's all about um, building something, usually a piece of metal, that takes the information you're trying to send and broadcasts it to the world. If you want it to be sent to everyone, like in the case of a radio, you make an omnidirectional antenna or, or a broad antenna. Uh, if you want it to be very directed or picking up signals from a very specific signal, then you go for like a directional antenna. Now in this case, I wanna show you something that's super, super cool, uh, which is uh, the project I am working on Astros Telescope JPL. Um, this is my main project here at NASA, and it's basically like this telescope that we're gonna hang on a balloon and we're gonna launch it from Antarctica. Uh, there's a massive antenna over here. It's a 2.5 meter dish antenna. So this is the antenna I'm, I'm working on right now. Uh, telescope antenna. Let's see. Of course, I spelled the mission wrong. Astros telescope antenna, there it is. So I'm working on this thing. 
So basically, this is a little like mirror reflector, and then it's gonna reflect over here, and then it, get, it gets picked up by um, a receiver. But in, in, in this case, this this reflector is 2.5 meters, it's very large, and it needs to be like perfectly smooth. These are like at very, very, very high frequencies. Um, and I've, I've worked on all sorts of antennas as well. Uh, as part of my, my PhD, I developed this really cool two-stage origami antenna, Karaguli. Um, this is some of my coolest uh, work. It's, it's, it, was a, it was for a very specialized application. This will probably never get cited or never really uh, like be famous for anything. But it's basically a type of horn antenna that deploys and breaks into two stages. And it's meant to be put on a uh, satellite that's like as small as this. Uh, so this is an example of what I have been doing, for example, as an antenna uh, engineer. You can work in wireless communication companies. You can work in space companies. Basically, any type of device that radiates signals out in space will need an antenna. So if you're an antenna engineer, uh, that's, that's, that's what you're going to be doing. So next up is RF and microwave. And basically, an, uh, RF stands for radio frequency. Uh, and ant antenna, in order for the antenna to radiate, you need to feed something into the antenna, the signal. And the signal is fed, it goes through an RF chain first before it goes through an antenna. This is an example of an RF cir uh, circuit. Usually they do involve a lot of uh, in inductors um, and um, some capacitors as well. Um, and they're usually like, uh, if you've ever heard of like matching networks or matching circuits, you need to match them uh, because you need to do face tracking when you're dealing with RF circuits. So it's not just like, uh, DC or AC circuits and uh, any type of like waveguide for example that you've ever seen um, where it's basically like the signal is traveling through here so think of this as something that replaces a wire where instead of just having the signal going through a wire you have the wave going through a waveguide and then the waveguide usually like feeds an antenna or like it goes into some other component like an amplifier uh, or, or, or something like that for example these are examples of antennas uh, in this case and um, this, this is a field that, again, uh, very, very sophisticated. It has, <laughs> you, when, when you take RF uh, circuits classes, you need to do the matching circuits and the matching networks, and you match them using these Smith charts. Uh, they are these like things that look very, very terrifying, uh, where basically all you're really trying to do is to balance the capacitance and the inductance of the circuits, uh, and obviously like um, match them to the same uh, impedance as well. Um, to make sure that the circuits are operating properly and that there are no losses. Uh, there's these basically uh, equations that you, you, you get a very deep understanding of. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it, I've taken two RF circuits classes in my master's program, uh, and a lot of the work I do does relate to RF, uh, obviously because I work a lot on antennas. And if you, if you really need to be good at understanding how antennas operate, uh, then you can work on RF uh, circuits. And uh, as an RF circuit, you can get a job as an RF engineer or as a microwave engineer, where you basically build these type of components or connect them or match them together. Uh, it's also a very, very uh, cool field. And this type of field usually scares a lot of people away. Uh, so there's not as many people uh, that go into this field, but there's a large demand for it as well. So if you end up liking RF and microwave circuits, uh, I would strongly recommend you go for it. Seventh thing I talk about uh, is photonics and optics. Uh, this is a very cool growing field. Uh, basically, if you think of any type of um, uh, thing involving lasers, whether in circuits or in, in, in uh, that is propagation, you're, you're really dealing with photonics and optics. If you think of fiber optic uh, glass for like the internet, fiber optics for like the internet, uh, it's basically things that look like this. Uh, this is basically a type of um, photonic or, 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 or uh, uh, laser uh, device because you're basically feeding light through it and you're guiding it through. So it's basically, f photonics is very similar to electronics, but instead of dealing with signals, electrical signals at lower frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum, you're basically dealing with light. Uh, and it doesn't have to be visible light, it could be infrared. Uh, so if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, Uh, we have something that looks like this. Basically, um, at very large wavelengths, small frequency, uh, you get waves that are really, really large. And then around like Bluetooth 2.4 gigahertz, it starts getting smaller. It's like 10 or 12 centimeters. But then over here, as you get towards the visible and ultraviolet, you go higher up on the spectrum. Then you start dealing with photonic devices. And then you start dealing with photonic circuits, uh, which are basically circuits that run off of, um, like, like as, as we can see, 
over here. Uh, the, the general principles are the same as like electronic circuits, is you're still dealing with data and you're still dealing with power and you're still trying to achieve some type of application. But in this case, you use it within uh, the, the photonics and the lasers domain. Uh, especially, I, I think, in the United States and in Germany, uh, it's a very growing field. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure about other countries, but in the US, uh, especially, there's a lot of uh, work happening that pertains uh, to photonics. And um, what I, I remember when I was, when I was um, during my master's program, I even worked on two CubeSats, a concept for two CubeSats that would communicate uh, through lasers uh, with each other. And even during my second Northrop Grumman internship, uh, I worked on laser uh, satellites, and a lot of times you basically need to uh, learn not just about the lasers themselves, but also some of the photonics devices that interface with the lasers uh, as well. Some uh, circuits like involve uh, electronics and photonics combined together, um, so you, a very good understanding of electronics will also help you get a very good understanding uh, of photonics and lasers and optics. Uh, but basically, if you if you study electrical engineering, there's a very good chance you may end up dealing with things in the visible or infrared uh, spectrum. And in this case, you would go into uh, this field as well. Now, an eighth career that you could do with electrical engineering is telecommunications slash signal processing. And basically, telecommunications is any type of like, uh, so t like by definition, tele means far, communication is communication. So any type of like long distance transmission or reception, it doesn't have to be long distance, could be any type of Distance, it's, it's really subjective. So telecommunications, we often think of like radio, we think of cell phones, we think of like just us um, transmitting information from one place to, to the other. Uh, but all, all telecommunications is, is you have one message from node A, you wanna send it to node B, and you basically want to do that as efficiently as possible with as little loss as possible. Now, while a lot of that happens in the air and like with physics, with electromagnetic physics, um, well, not really in the air and, and free space, technically. Um, so it does involve a lot of the antenna and the RF work that I've mentioned earlier. But as far as actually figuring out how to equip the information on the signals and sending them through the antenna, uh, that involves um, a lot of signal processing. And signal processing is basically uh, a nightmare for a lot of en electrical engineering students because it's basically a lot of math. It's a lot of very intense math. It's a lot of Fourier transforms. You basically have some type of signal. You apply a lot of filtering. Uh, you're, you're basically manipulating signals to try to get them to look how you want them to look. That's really what it comes down to. A lot of that, um, can, it can be done digitally or it can be done in, in analog. Uh, the, the, the founding concept of signal processing really is the Fourier transform. It's basically where you're taking a time domain signal and you're uh, basically adding a bunch of sine waves and, and cosine waves. Uh, and you're basically uh, see, seeing what it would look like in the uh, frequency domain. And then once you're able to transform it uh, to, the fr to, to the frequency domain, you're able to see what the different components look like. So in, in, in any type of equalizer uh, that you see, where you're basically looking at different frequencies at different, uh, in this case, like let's say these are like the very low frequencies, these are like the very high frequencies, all you're really looking at is the Fourier transform of a time domain signal, like let's say a song, and we're able to see, oh, like the very low frequencies are high, the mid frequencies are either high or low or, 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 or things of that nature. So in your car, for example, when you go um, to the sound, like an equalizer in a car radio, uh, it looks something like this. Well, pff, your sprite does not look nearly as sophisticated as this. Uh, let's see the display. Um, so I just want high, low, mid, or actually something uh, high, low, mid, equalizer. Yeah, something as simple as this, where you literally only have like high, mid, low. All this is really doing is it's looking at the frequency domain, basically, uh, of the signal. And it's, it's, it's taking the, 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 the low components and either increasing them or decreasing them, mid components, high components. Um, so in signal processing, you deal with basically a lot of math that just plays around with the signal. You, you pick up a signal uh, in, in time domain, you perform the Fourier transform and you're able to break it into its frequency components. Uh, this is where a lot of audio engineering is involved. So if you've ever made uh, like electronic uh, music, uh, I, actually I'm gonna brag for a little bit because I, I have, uh, I made, um, let's see if I can search it up. <laughs> I remember back a while ago, I made uh, um, an album 
um, chat disabled. Yes, this is an album me and my friend made. Uh, and uh, we, we made seven electronic uh, music songs. Uh, and we did it in this software called Ableton Live. And this is like basically just signal processing on steroids, where all you're really doing is you're coming up with sounds, and then you're applying all types of filters to it to manipulate the sounds. And you're obviously adding different plugins and things of the nature. So if, you, if, you, if you're interested in signal processing, one really fun thing you can do is you can download something like Ableton or like FL Studio um, uh, or any type of uh, software that helps you create uh, electronic music or any type of music or sounds. And what you can do is you can just make some sounds and then try out a bunch of different filters and then go to like an open an equalizer or go to like uh, different components that help you play around with the frequency uh, uh, components of the signal. And that would be something uh, super, super fun. And that's something I did a lot. So I think I even mentioned that in my book where I say uh, signal processing, I worked on, uh, oh no, I don't, think, I don't think I mentioned it here. I did work on like some 5G and 6G projects as well. Uh, but basically, a sig a signal processing is based on this class, signals and systems. This, this was hands down the, the coolest class I have taken my entire life. Uh, this class changed my life. I don't know, it just made something click in my head. Uh, and I don't know, it's just a, a lot of people hate this class. I hated it too because it was very hard, but I also loved it. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> um, okay, so that's basically signal processing and um, uh, telecommunications, basically, I, I merged them together as one thing. Ninth thing uh, you could do is, is networking. And networking is basically, like like by definition, a network is something that's made up of multiple nodes or multiple components. So um, a bunch of computers talking to each other is a network. A bunch of phones talking to each other is a network. Uh, a bunch of humans talking to each other is a network. A bunch of satellites. So if you look at a satellite constellations or like SpaceX Starlink, for example, uh, technically, that is a network of satellites, and they have to coordinate between them. Uh, networking is kind of at the interface of electrical engineering and math, because, um, and when I say math, is because you need to come up with sophisticated ways uh, for 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 the nodes b uh, within the network to talk to each other. Now, the very very, um, um, like a very basic example is IP. Uh, network internet protocol and this is basically where like a lot of protocols and architectures are developed so this is where you kind of like branch away from the physics and you branch away from the real world and you kind of enter a more abstracted world where based on uh, architectures and it, it becomes kind of more of an art uh, there's an art involved in every branch of electrical engineering but in this case I would, I'd say when you're coming up with a specific architecture or a protocol uh, since many protocols usually exist serving the same function depending on which application you're interested in you may go with different uh, protocol uh, it, this has a bit more of an, an, an art to it uh, if you look at something like this and you're immediately intrigued and you're curious about like how a group of computers within one region will communicate with a group of computers and how do you organize the flow of that information how do you organize that traffic uh, think of it as basically like cars going through highways and going through uh, small streets how would you architect uh, the, who goes who goes first and who does what and what happens if someone doesn't make it what happens if your signal is lost do you ask for it again or do you have some type of uh, built-in system that prevents the error from having in the first place um, there's this I, uh, um, I I think it's called iOS model or um, networking model I forgot what it stands for OSI model um, what does OSI model stand for? Um, open system interconnection. Sure. Okay. So the OSI model is basically uh, the different layers of 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 uh, communications and of networking. The physical layer is really where like anything physical happens. So this is not only like the the actual propagation of the signals them getting picked up this is also the signal processing the modulation involved anything above that like like the data link usually uh involves the uh what you do with the ones and zeros do you add error control i believe error control or forward error correction usually takes place here and then you have the network layer and the, and the transport layer and these are really the layers where the networking architectures start kicking in where it's like who who does what first who goes uh towards what first uh, if you're interested in networking, I think I even mentioned this. I would say, yeah, look into this OSI model. Um, or I give an example, I think in this case, of an ATM. 
Um, it's, it's, it's a really cool field. A lot of people do go into it. It does interface a lot with software and math and you kind of get away from the hardware uh, and, and, and hands-on uh, things. So if that's your cup of tea, uh, you can go for it. Uh, tenth thing in this case is controls. And basically a control system is any system. Uh, actually, um, I'm gonna show you something really cool here. Uh, control system eventually comes down to something where the inputs and the outputs are, are dependent on each other or like influenced by one another. Like over here, this is kind of a very simple example of a feedback uh, system where you have like some type of input, it goes through some system, and then based on the output, the output goes back and it feeds. Uh, this is essentially a very basic control system. Um, and with controls, you're basically trying to control something. A very basic, a very basic control circuit is a thermostat. Uh, very, very simple. Uh, because what does a thermostat do? Is you're telling it, hey, I want the temperature to be 72 degrees. And then there's going to be sensors that are going to go out in your room and they're like detecting what the temperature is. And let's say it's like 65 degrees. It's way colder than you want it to be. Then it's going to heat up the room and keep checking for the sensors until the sensors match the 72 degrees. So what you set as the input and as the output, they're matching each other. Then the, uh, the, the, the control system is, 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 is well aligned. The moment the sensor detection starts veering off from what you actually want, that circuitry kicks in and goes into action. Now, control systems are very, very powerful. They're used in like everything. Uh, they're used in cars, they're used in airplanes, they're used in anything where you ideally want to maintain some type of stability and you're constantly detecting fluctuations in some inputs uh, based on some sensor data or some, some way that you're picking up data from the real world and you want to adjust it to uh, be the thing that you want. Uh, in airplanes, for example, control systems are extremely, extremely important at maintaining like altitude and maintaining uh, all sorts of things that uh, keep flying very safe. Uh, airplanes are actually way safer than cars. Statistically, you're a lot, you're a lot more likely um, to die in a car crash than an airplane. And uh, there are many reasons for that, but the main reason is that uh, there's a lot of control systems involved in airplanes. Uh, and, 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 and in a car, there's the human element, which involves all types of errors. Uh, which, I mean, you could be texting and driving, you could be making like some type of errors. There's other variables as well. I don't want people jumping in the comments and, and, and attacking this wild claim of mine. It's not a claim at all. It's just an example I thought of uh, for control systems. Now, 11th is power. Power, again, is very popular. Uh, this is especially if you're not like, if you're not living in the United States or Germany or China or like in if, if you're not living in a country where there's a lot of production relating to electronics or relating to uh, embedded systems or things of that nature. Uh, the very default thing people usually go for in electrical engineering is power or is energy systems. Uh, and that's is basically pretty self-explanatory. Like power engineers understand how power is distributed, uh, is generated, stored and distributed. And it could be on a small scale, like in power generators. Like I used to live in Buffalo, New York and we had like Niagara Falls. Um, so we had this, this very cool waterfall and then based on the, 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 the energy of the water drops, uh, some, some, uh, the, the, we, we, would, we, would t we would harness that energy and then we would distribute it through the, uh, th through the network or like some um, uh, like solar panels, for example, an, an example of something where uh, solar energy or radiation from the sun, which carries photons, which are energetic, they come in, they interface with the solar panel, excites something and that induces an electron. And then you basically have electricity as a result. So this is an example of some type of power system that converts one form of energy to the other. But eventually all power really boils down to on the large scale is the distribution and storage of energy. However, there is a branch called power electronics. So when you're dealing with electronics, this is kind of at the end, this is still within electronics really, it's not really power. But when you're dealing with electronics or when you're dealing with circuit boards, very often uh, you, you need to transfer energy throughout the circuit board, obviously. Everything runs on current, everything runs on voltage. Um, and you basically need to understand that, okay, if I have a DC battery that is very, very large, but then a component that takes that only requires a small voltage, how do I drop that voltage very safely and, and energetically uh, conservatively? Uh, how do I do that? Uh, let's say I have, I want to convert from AC to a DC uh, signal. How do I do that? Uh, you build these type of circuits that m basically manipulate how the energy uh, travels around the circuits. And this field is called power electronics. This is really, really cool. Uh, if you want to work on small stuff, if you want to work on large stuff, then you can work on energy systems uh, or power systems, which is like anything relating to like the electricity that's coming 
um, for example. So 12th is microelectronics, microfabrication. And this is basically a branch that deals with uh, like really, really small uh, scale circuits. So while like a regular circuit looks like this, where it can be large, the battery can be literally like this size and the light is this size and whatnot. A microelectronic circuit is much, much smaller. Everything happens on the uh, like micrometer or nanometer scale. Um, and this is where you learn a lot about like transistors, for example, most transistors uh, and chips, integrated circuits, these are all microelectronic circuits uh, mostly. And you're basically looking inside what happens inside that chip and how, how's the circuitry inside of it. Uh, there's people that obviously that need to fabricate this using like wafers and things of that nature. Uh, these are micro fabrications engineers. They usually wear these things. Uh, I, 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 I personally would not go into that branch just because I don't want to wear this thing <laughs> every day. I want to be in my t-shirt uh, designing antennas on a computer or like designing systems. Uh, so that, that does contribute into like how you choose a career, uh, I guess, but I don't know. It's a very cool field. Uh, thir 13 is biomedical engineering. So any type of imaging application, so like biomedical imaging, um, when you're dealing with things like that, or like when you're, when you're, when you're like this is an MRI, when you're going through an MRI, all the MRI is doing is basically um, using electromagnetic signals, using magnetic fields uh, to basically uh, induce some type of fluctuations in, 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 your, in your cells or in the electrons or the atoms uh, inside your body. And it's basically translating that behavior into some type of image that we're able to look at it. So a lot of biomedical engineering is actually electrical engineering. Anything pertaining to biomedical sensors is electrical engineering. Anything pertaining to biomedical imaging is electrical engineering. Um, so if, you, if you're someone who's interested in a human body and you study electrical or electronics engineering, uh, you can work in biomedical applications. Uh, that's actually something I did. My, my very first experience was in an MRI lab. And these MRIs like, are super, super, super cool. Um, and any type of imaging or instrumentation um, is really built by electrical engineers, not really biomedical engineers. Biomedical engineering is a, is a really tricky major because like, biomed there's no such thing as biomedical engineering. Um, there is electrical engineering based on electromagnetic physics. There's mechanical engineering based on mechanics. Uh, there's chemical engineering based on the chemical processes. Uh, you can argue that it's like, and, and there's like materials. Um, but like biomedical engineering is really kind of a jack of all trade. Like in a biomedical engineering degree, you take a bunch of mechanical courses, electrical courses, computer science courses, blah, blah, blah. But then you specialize. If you specialize in the electrical domain, then you work on things such as MRIs and whatnot and sensors and wearables and things of that nature. Uh, 14th career uh, you can go for is physics. So if you decide like all of this stuff is not for you, it's too application oriented and you're mostly interested like uh, like, like in the electromagnetic physics itself, like in the very basic fundamental understanding of how this stuff even operates, or even maybe in like quantum physics. Uh, if, you, if you're more interested in the theory and you don't care enough to build something or apply it, then you should probably go more the theoretical physics route. You can still do that with an electrical engineering degree because in electrical engineering, you build the foundation for understanding electromagnetic waves and physics and math. Uh, and once you learn how to do that, you don't have to go and build something with it. Uh, you can go and, and pursue physics. And the very last thing here I mentioned is like literally anything else, um, like literally anything else. So basically, once you study engineering or electrical engineering, what you're really getting is not necessarily the, oh, I can build a circuit or I can do any of that. What you're really getting is I can solve a problem. I can figure out what needs to be done and I can quickly think up a solution on how to do it. That's the real value of an engineer. And if you can do that within electronics or antennas or telecommunications or whatnot, you can go do that in other domains, such as starting a business. Uh, in fact, the, the top level entrepreneurs and business owners, such as Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, uh, Henry Ford, these guys are all engineers. They all have engineering or physics background. Uh, Elon Musk studied physics, Jeff Bezos studied electrical engineering, and, and, and Henry Ford, before he started selling cars, he would literally build the car engines himself. Uh, and, and the people who have a very good understanding of physics and math, and how to identify variables and solve for them and, and build something and solve a problem. That gives you a very strong foundation in other areas in life, such as business, such as if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a lawyer, if you want to do things of that nature. Uh, but anyway, that pretty much covers 15 different uh, fields that I, I was able to come up with, at least when I wrote this book. Um, I will put a link, obviously, for this book if you want to read it. Uh, I would highly recommend you go ahead and read it. Uh, it is very affordable on Amazon. If you cannot afford it, uh, there's a PDF version that is free 
uh, we, we, we have it pinned somewhere in our Discord server, so you can just join our, our server and ask for it. Um, and um, I, I, would, I would really suggest you read it because it will give you an entire roadmap of not just the different branches, but also what should you do within like, should, is this even the right major for you? What should you do with your life and things of that nature? Um, with that being said, I will see you guys uh, in the next video. If you liked it, leave a comment, tell me what specifically you liked or what uh, branch you're considering doing. Maybe you could talk to the other people in the community and, and maybe, maybe this video can help you figure out what you want to do with your life. But with that being said again, I'll see you guys next time. Peace and love.